Welcome to Your Expansive Self Podcast with myself, Tasha Crittle. I'm a deep inner healing and self-expansion coach, breathwork and meditation teacher, and a passionate student of life itself. My goal is to share with you all that I can to ultimately help you become and embody your highest self in every aspect of your life. We dive deep into expansive conversations about self-healing, conscious business, relationships, and even ancient practices, fully combining the science with the spiritual. No BS, no filter, sharing from my heart to yours with integrity, love, and wisdom. I am so honored and excited to have you here with me, so let's get started. Hello, my sunshines. I hope you guys are doing so well and so amazing. I've been a little MIA on the podcast. Oh my God, the last podcast I posted was 15 days ago, I just realized. Honestly, I have been enjoying my life (laughs) a lot. So I've just been, you know, working a lot with my clients, actually. It's like the number doubled in September. And so I really wanted to take the time to commit to that first and the other time to just enjoy and, you know, be in the ocean as much as I can and move and just be present. There's been so much presence in my life and uh, it's been really, really, really nice. So yeah, today, today we have a beautiful podcast episode with Stefanos Stefandos, who is a relationship coach. And today we talk about a bunch of different things, actually. Um, It's kind of like a brief but clear type of conversation, so it's not as long as my usual interviews, Um, but today we talk about masculine and feminine energies, what that means, what it means to be in a conscious relationship, um, you know, aspects of loving yourself before loving a partner, um, fear of rejection, just different things that really play a part in the most common aspects of really being in a deep committed relationship. We also talk talk about inner child healing, how big of a part it is, and how it impacts us in our lives every single day. Um, He also talks about his own healing practices and how he works in terms of somatic healing. And from that, I hope you guys enjoy the conversation and interview I had with Stefanos. Again, remember to share with your audience, social media, even a friend or your partner. If there's something that really resonates with you during this podcast episode, to just share it with whoever, whenever. Because again, even if you can just plant one seed, that is all we need in order to create change for somebody. So enjoy my loves and I will see you after the interview. Hi, Stephanos. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So I feel like one of the main things that I, you know, really wanted to have you on for was obviously because of your work, um, just talking so much about relationships and there, I feel like there's such a, an emotional, a deep emotional concept to your work that a lot of people don't even, I guess, associate to. And so tell us who you are, what you do and what your purpose here on this earth is. Sure. So I I work in the realm of relationships, um, really helping people understand themselves at deeper levels, moving from undesirable relationships into an undesirable states of being in the world into more desirable states of being and understanding that there's a congruency that's required in order to be the best version of self. And so how do we unpack that? So I help people deal with their past traumas, any inner inner childhood wounds that they've experienced, um, if they have tightness uh, around memories, uh, painful experiences that they've had, fears that they've latched onto that are stopping them from living a really more, a more open life in the present moment, um, that's, that's really what I help people with. In terms of alchemy or transformation or helping people shift through, um, again, healthy relationships, uh, unhealthy relationships into healthy relationships, 
it's a process of getting to know self at a deeper level, but creating the safety and the, and the confidence for someone to really delve deeper into who are they. It's a lot of shadow work. That's a big part of it as well. Future visioning. But before we can get to that, we've got to clear the past. So in essence, that's the work that I do in the world, so to speak with individuals, men, women, couples, um, I'll, I'll take large groups, small groups, in person, virtual with programs. I, um, take people also on retreats in terms of, and my wife and I both do this together and, and separately, but where I'll take people up into the mountains or a small group of people and we'll do personal development up in altitude and really come face to face. with What does it feel like to be physically challenged? What are the parallels drawn, not only in our lives, but also in our, in our key relationships and how do we navigate that in the most effective way as well? Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit about what I do. Amazing. And it's like, well, your relationship with your wife, of course, like, is it, did you guys do this work separately yes. before you guys met and then you guys met and like merged mm. your work together? Yes. Okay. Amazing. And we still have our work separately as well. Oh, okay. Compl- okay. Amazing. That's, that's incredible. Um, so I would, I would love to, you know, really, I think a big part that's that there's a lot of like information that I hear lately. And I think a lot of people are like diving into it in terms of like, feminine and masculine energies i think a lot of people are confused as to what it means because they assume like as a woman we're just like a feminine energy and it plays a big part as to again in our society too like the western world like there's a lot of you know toxic masculine toxic feminine and i would love to get a little bit more of clarity uh, as to what that means and how it plays a big part in relationships or even like on a daily basis with our own relationship with ourselves Sure, masculine feminine energies or energetics reside within all of us. Yeah. It's a contrasted energy, yeah, expressive. It, it's not exclusive to men. Like masculinity is not exclusive to men per se. Femininity is not exclusive to women. It just helps us understand the world. Like two wings of the same bird, two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. There's a duality and a polarity. There's complementary opposites and there's also... Um, a duality that exists that helps us understand we learn deeply through contrast so we're talking about masculine feminine energetics when we apply this to our lives in a balanced or healthy way we seem to function the best so an example of that could be this masculine energetic as an example is that doing or go energy it's about completion energy it's about goal orientation setting tasks and achieving them it's about linear creation. It's about bi- a binary understanding of the world. Now, in certain circumstances, we need that. But we need to be um, directed in that way. So, in, in, for example, the corporate world or business is generally masculine orientated. The issue is that so much of the world has this leniency towards masculine energetic. That doesn't mean the masculine energy is wrong or bad. It just means that we're probably overusing it a little too much in our, in our lives, mm-hmm. in our world. And so and then, therefore it becomes intensified or extreme and there's no balance point. That feminine energetic is less about achievement, less about goal orientation and completion and more about present moment awareness, more about the unpacking of the experience itself as opposed to a final destination or an outcome. And when we do too, too little of that, we feel almost imbalanced in the way that we express in the world. Mm. So for example, we need probably more time for leisure. We need more time for reflection. We need, we need more time for just being with ourselves without having to rush to do anything. See, we define ourselves in our world by the actions that we take, the things that we do, the status, the titles, the material possession and so forth. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we do too much of it, we feel almost imbalanced. Like we're just, we're, we're just uh, going through life, uh, turning left, always just turning left, turning left, turning left, and we're never turning right. And there, there just seems to be an imbalance there. And so masculine and feminine energetics, it resides within all of us. Mm. Um, there are some authors, and I tend to agree with this, that will say that if you're a male, if you're a man um, in a male body, you will have more of an inclination to your core energetic or your core energy will naturally be more masculine. And if you're a female core energy will naturally be more feminine. It's not true for everyone, 
probably true for most people, I would say, from what I've experienced and the clients that I've worked with. Um, there are biological reasons for this, gender-based reasons for this, but that's not exclusive to gender. Cultural reasons for this, evolutionary reasons for this, quote-unquote uh, spiritual slash emotional reasons for this. So it's, it's quite a complex conversation to have. But just know it's just a way to express ourselves and understand ourselves. We learn through contrast. Learning through contrast means we get to grow. Growth is a primary directive of the human condition. Mm -hmm. Completely. And, you know, even understanding our own polarities is we're, when we're able to understand our own, then we're able to understand the polarities in other people too, right? So this is often what I just say in general, but I really believe, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, our relationship with our own self will completely reflect with the relationships we have with, with others, right? So I feel yeah. like there's a lot of people in this state right now where, you know, pe more people are getting more awake and more aware and more conscious of their own attractions. And so they're constantly going to like, okay, I'm going to attract my king. I'm going to attract my queen. Um, but it's not happening. And then they go, oh, it's going to come. It's going to come. Or they're not doing the inner work or they're just com completely still looking for this external um, thing that can fill that, I guess, void or want or need. So what is your, I guess, advice or opinion or view on this whole, you know, attracting the partner that you want? Um, how much does it go into depth as to your own relationship with yourself? Like how much responsibility can you take according to who you attract and how, how strong is it? The truth of it is if we are seeking goodness or seeking to be compensated or to be made to feel better outside of ourselves there's so much that is outside of our control outside of ourselves that it's going to be very difficult to actually attain or embody that mm -hmm. and we're going to feel like we're stuck on this perpetual hamster wheel and that's also known as codependence where we are relying on our own happiness we are basing our happiness on how others see us how they treat us and what they think about us how they behave with us, what they, what they show us. And we can't control that. People have their own agenda, their own biases, their own pain, their own fears, etc. And so it becomes super, super important that the primary source of inspiration not be outside of ourselves in the sense that how someone else sees me or treats me or loves me or cares for me is going to determine how happy I end up being. And when we go into relationships in that way, we become desperate and needy. And sometimes we become even aggressive when we don't get our own way. So either way, we're pushing people away. Or we're isolating ourselves. And that's not a healthy place to be. So I think the opportunity is that we come back into self-love. We come back into how can we see ourselves in such a way that is empowering? How can we heal our past so that we can feel um, calmer and more connected and more grateful in the present? How can we appreciate ourselves? What do we need to do for ourselves and who do we need to be for ourselves in order to appreciate ourselves at deep level? So we're not looking outside of us. We're not coming from desperation. We're not coming from neediness or that, that even hyper selfish energy because you know, the, the people pleasing that, that need to contort oneself in order to satisfy others over one's own needs and values. That's actually really selfish. It appears to be for the other person, but it's only for the other person as an ends to a means to satisfy our sense of feeling better. And so we have to fill that void ourselves. We can't rely on the, the, the father that abandoned us when we were seven years old to come back and say, Hey, I'm sorry. Because even if they did, and they did everything they could, unless you heal that within yourself and feel those unfelt feelings and process that not completely on your own with assistance. Absolutely. But if you don't do that, you're going to get really stuck and you're going to be reliant on others and they're going to constantly and perpetually disappoint you because it's always pointing back to your own self-worth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like most people don't realize that they're in that space sometimes to mm. like their relationships are completely in a massive funk or they're, I don't know, in a break of like divorce or something. And I guess this goes back to, you know, inner child healing, right? And like, this, this literally um, programs our entire energetics growing up. So what are some things that you see, I guess, most commonly when it comes to 
the healing the inner child and how much of an impact does it play in relationships? Coming back into one's self worth. Mm. Is that what you're is that what you're asking? Well, so no, how- just just like understanding how the the inner child itself, like yes. healing that and how much it plays a part. Like let's say there was a toxic relationship with a father or a mother, how much those and that time in your life impacts your relationships now. Massively. So during our developmental years, we form a sense of the of the self and a sense of the world, how we give and receive love how we um, feel safe in giving ourselves, what we are attracted to, our values. So much of who we are is formed during the ages of zero to 12, zero to nine even. And then there's, there's developmental stages within that larger developmental stage. Mm-hmm. What generally happens is experiences that we have that are traumatic or painful experiences as a child, whether it's physically or psychologically or emotionally painful as a child, we compartmentalize in order to protect the rest of the self. But what happens is as we compartmentalize all these negative or painful experiences, we develop parts to ourselves. Now, these parts also form protectors or soldiers that defend these parts of ourselves and protect these parts of ourselves. In parts therapy, it's called the exiled self or part, uh, the exiled parts of self. These protectors come to protect this wound. So, for example, say as a child, your mother beat you, physically beat you a great deal. That's a very hard thing to do. And maybe one of the coping strategies you developed was sort of leaving your body and numbing yourself when you were getting that beating so that your nervous system wouldn't feel so much pain and that you wouldn't be so emotionally disparate in that time because it's very difficult to be beaten by someone that's meant to look after you and care for you and that you love and care for. Mm. That can be really, really, really intense. And so what happens is you'll develop that strategy even when as an adult, that doesn't mean that you're going to be beaten as an adult, but if someone is mistreating you or if someone is not respecting you, if you're perceiving someone that you trust and love and care for, if there's a a, a hint or a familiarity of it being a similar energetic, you're going to shut down and check out emotionally maybe. So then therefore you're not showing up to that person and they're unable to penetrate you because you're just distancing yourself. So you're constantly in this place of I'm isolating, I'm isolating. And so you're wondering why am I having these very similar relationships, but with different people? Well, it's because you're not able to look at that painful experience that you've had or experiences that you've had in the past and you haven't been able to heal them or equilibrate them, Mm. feel the unexpressed and unfelt feelings at the time and move through into a different version of self by choosing to protect yourself in a new way and allowing that inner child, that little, that part of you that was so hurt to actually run free and flourish because that little boy or girl inside of you, they weren't free at that Mm -hmm. time and we all need that freedom as children we all need to feel safe as children Mm -hmm. and it's like safety of being seen being heard being loved um belonging it's like all the core human conditions that we need in order to thrive Mm -hmm. and you know this plays another part of like vulnerability like i think it's what is vulnerability and like i think there's like a, a misconception as to what it means especially vulnerability with ourselves vulnerability with others how much it plays a part with, I read your post actually, uh, was it last night that you posted it or yesterday, a couple of days ago about, you know, having sex and uh, that, that, that masculine mm-hmm. energy that is able to hold this, the woman who is vulnerable, who is showing herself. So where do you think it plays a part in, again, relationships and sex, that vulnerability? Well, the ability to allow ourselves to be seen means we become more open in our intimate interactions. And if we're more open, we inspire naturally others to be more open. And so now all of a sudden we have this interchange of sharing at a deeper level that we maybe haven't gone to before. And the truth of it is this allows us to, um, during that um that unstable feeling of being emotionally exposed and being uncertain in how that person's going to receive us. If we're not as attached to the outcome, in other words, how they see us, but we're more there to be emotionally expressive or intellectually expressive, physically, sexually expressive. And that person meets us there. 
that can reinforce a deeper sense of self-worth. And this is the power of relationships, right? And healthy relationships. It's not about the other person doing our work or healing us, but it is about being each other's beacon of inspiration. Mm. I think that, that's something that we really we miss because, you know, vulnerability involves uncertainty and it involves risk and emotional exposure. It involves this, this fear of being seen. But when we are able to step through that, we give ourselves an opportunity to grow through some of the past pains that we experienced as young people. Because mm. I feel like, um, you know, even what would you say when it, when it comes to practicing that vulnerability with a partner, you know, is there exercises that you would suggest or even vulnerability with ourselves within our own lives? Let's say we are single, you know, mm. how can we bring forth more of that safe vulnerability mm. It's just in a safe container. Yeah. We'll become more self-aware. So self-awareness is key because it gives you a foundation of where do I go from here? And so one of the ways we can be more self-aware is begin to express your emotions and express your thoughts and feelings, whether that's in a reflective journal or sharing yourself with others and speaking into your truth. That can be really important. Um, do things that scare you on a, on a regular basis. You know, practice courage, basically. Um, practice moving through your fear, whether that's applying for a job that you think you're not going to get, talking to that girl at the bar, um, you know, opening up or starting that business that you really wanted to start, or as simple as um, taking up an exercise regime that you know is going to be challenging. Like challenge yourself and, and, and move through different extre extremities of the spectrum of fear is really, um, really important. You know, so face that fear, um, mm -hmm. move through it. Don't just, don't just, stand on the sidelines and be paralyzed by fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think Brene Brown says, you know, seek excellence, not perfection. In other words, progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not about, it's not about getting it right. 100%. Be open to being open to rejection or humiliation or abandonment. But what underpins all of that, and that's a big thing to say, it's like, what do you mean? Be open to yeah. <laughs> comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. But what underpins all that is you working on your self worth. Mm -hmm. here's, here's an interesting perspective I take on rejection. When someone rejects our ideas or our expression or something that we do or someone that we are, maybe we put a post up on social media and someone says, you're wrong, you're wrong, you shouldn't think of oh, this, what about this, what about that? We take it personally. And we think that person's rejecting us. But, you know, we get a little bit of ahead of ourselves and our egos, our, our, they get, become a little inflated. And the, what I, why I say that is because that person that's attacking you, sure, maybe the way they're doing that is not healthy and it's not, it's not exactly mature. However, the idea that they're rejecting is the idea, not necessarily you. They've probably disliked your political view that you happen to hold or the value set or the expression that you're holding for years before they even knew you existed. And maybe they're having a really bad day and they're just taking out on you and they were scrolling through their feed and they saw that. We take rejection too personally sometimes. And so that's what I mean about, you know, be comfortable to move through the rejection. Do it for the sake of doing it, the intrinsic value of taking action on what's important for you. And that means doing your inner work, cultivating deeper self-esteem, a more profound self-esteem, deeper levels of self-worth and, and value. Really see yourself, um, you know, valuable. And, and that leads us on to this perspective switch. Like see, see, see the opportunity in things you know, don't, don't just see the negative, see the opportunity as well. That helps us step into vulnerability because like, Oh, I can maybe, I can maybe there's some value in doing this, you know, be authentic, be genuine, be real, be you mm. um, unapologetically. These are ways to practice vulnerability. Again, that's maybe speaking your truth. You're in a board meeting and you're, you want to speak up and, but usually you'd be embarrassed or shy to speak up or someone may challenge you. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to speak up. I'm going to speak up in a compassionate way. I'm going to say what I think is important for this company or for myself or for the employees that are sitting here or the directors that are sitting here, whatever it may be, I use that as an example, or maybe your partner, mm -hmm. you know, there's something that's on your heart and mind. You want to talk to them about, you know, you may be, you may be you're in a non-monogamous relationship and you're thinking about moving into a monogamous relationship and you're scared that your partner's going to say, no, that's not what we agreed on. I want non-monogamy. Now you want monogamy. What are we going to do? And you're going to lose your partner, but your truth is your truth. You've got to be unapologetically you. If you're clear on that's what you want and that's what you need to step into. So there are some ways that, you know, you can practice that vulnerability. Why is it so hard for women or men? Funny enough, I just said women, but I guess men too, um, to speak their truth. 
because yeah. we're scared because we have a primal fear of rejection, abandonment, and humiliation. And that's deep mm -hmm. in our brainstem. It's deep. Mm -hmm. It's deep in our evolution. Like if you were out of the, if someone disagreed with you and they were a prominent member of the group or enough people in that group disagreed with you or didn't like you or thought you were wrong, whatever that means, or you did something quite unquote wrong, wrong or harmed the group, you'd be in the out group. Out group means death. 100,000, 500,000, 2 million years ago, it meant death. Our environment was volatile. This is a very primal thing. That's why speaking from stage is one of the most painful experiences we can do for most of us. Because if those people disagree with us, we're, we're going to feel like we're being outed because someone, the, the, uh, our, our, the masses are disagreeing with our truth. That is so intense. I feel like that's, yeah, that's a very, it's a very strong thing for people to even recognize and to admit and to like choose again every single day. And um, so I had a really interesting question actually that popped up on my Instagram today when I said that I was going to interview you. And I think a lot of people can, you know, um, relate to this is sometimes you get people get into relationships where one person does the inner work and the other doesn't want to do the inner work, or maybe they're just not ready to do the inner work. So there's like this mix of like dark times that this person is going through. So it's like, do I stick with this person? Do I assist this person? Or do I like, is this a recall to like really, again, speak my truth and remember what I want and need as a person, as a human in a relationship? Where do you think, you know, you could guide somebody when they're in that, that state of choosing or reflecting or yeah, I feel like it's a kind of like a complicated situation, but you see a lot of that right now of that yeah. choosing to do work and not doing work in a partnership and like, sure. where do things go? Sure. So one more, one more piece on the rejection component. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why, sorry, vulnerability is so difficult is because the, we've been rejected or abandoned or humiliated, core, core fears from our parents or from those people that we really cared for when we were younger, we exposed part of ourselves and it was rejected or it was shamed. And that shame stays with us. And then it becomes very difficult to come out of that shame as adults because we, it becomes paralyzing, which leads me, leads me into this. Why do we even need to do the inner work as adults? Because we experience a lot of pain generally for most of us as children. And even if we don't experience immense trauma or pain or torture or, or any of that, um, we, or abuse, we, we sometimes perceive ourselves to not have, we, we just hurt, we're hurt little children. And so to answer your question very directly and very succinctly, people in a relationship can be working on themselves and still be in a relationship. They just need to be willing and aware. They need to be aware of their core wounds and they need to be willing to work on it and not blame and project and shame the other person. Mm. And in saying that, you've got to do a certain level of inner work yourself. And I can't tell you what that is. There's no real objective measure. You will know. And if you're not clear whether you should be in a relationship, don't fucking be in a relationship. It's as simple as that. It really is. It's not, it's not super complex. People, we make it complex. I did that for so long. I was so uncertain and I projected that uncertainty in the relationship. And I just, I caused issues for myself and for my partners because mm. I was uncertain and I was not living in truth. And I had a fear of being vulnerable and a fear of telling my truth and a fear of being rejected and a fear of how people saw me being changed and all of that facade that goes with that and all of the unhealed wounds. And I just caused drama after drama. So trust me from direct experience and the thousands and thousands of people that I've worked with, get clear on what you want. Yes, you can be in a relationship and working on your stuff and you have to do a certain level of work before you can really be open and honest in a relationship mm. because you have to clear some of those demons that will otherwise keep coming back and triggering you hard. You won't be able to sustain the, the sometimes intensity that comes with being in a relationship if you haven't worked at some of the core stuff in your relationship, in mm -hmm. your own self self. Yeah, completely. And so that like brings me on to my next point. A lot of people will like do the inner work either in a relationship or not. Um, and then they'll often say, you know, oh, I'm not ready just yet because I have more work to do. But I feel like sometimes that can be used also as an a way as a way to like avoid or escape the possibility of even being in a relationship. So is, yeah. where can you, yeah, where can, how do you can how can you draw the line of like, are you ready? Are you not ready? How do you know? I'm, I'm going to purposely not answer that. I'm, <laughs> not to be. Mean, I'm going to tell you why because part of the issue is we want people to make decisions for us. You need to make mm. the decision yourself. You need mm. to work that out yourself. That requires effort. 
curiosity and exploration. That requires you deep diving in yourself because when you know, you'll know. It's as simple as that. I can't tell you, um, Mahatma Gandhi can't tell you, the greatest spiritual teachers of our times can't tell you. You've got to figure it out yourself. Mm-hmm. And there's value in doing so. That's part of the journey. And if you're asking, I don't know, how do I know? The answer is in that. Go deeper into what, why you don't know. Go deeper into the feeling and the sensation of not knowing. Go deeper into not having clarity. What's it representing for you? What's it, how's it showing up in your life? What's it really giving you? What do you truly desire? What are you saying you want, but your actions are different? Explore the chasms of your being and you'll have the answer. Mm, completely. And so with your work in general, is there a way that you welcome in your clients or potential clients in terms of really diving deeper in the inner child um, healing? Or I think I heard um, you talking about somatic healing um, on a podcast before. So even like, what does that Mm. mean to people who don't know and how much can it help them to release that Mm. trauma and those demons, like you said? Yeah, so psycho... Uh, psycho, I do, I do something called psycho um, uh, somatic healing. Mm. So essentially, when we when we experience, when we have any experience, um, or we we register trauma, we register trauma generally in a couple of ways through our brains, cognitively and intellectually, so to speak, and emotionally. We also register it in our bodies at a cellular level. And so moving through um, trauma intellectually, so reframing, rewriting, uh, reinstating new belief systems, it's one way of dealing with the issues, but we have to shift it and move it from our body. So somatic work such as breath work, such as engaging in even plant medicines or or, um, consciousness expanding work, whilst physically working with the body and dislodging some of where that trauma was, was held and kept can be very profound for even just moving to the final stages of uh, freedom, internal freedom. So that's a somatic component in terms of inner child or working with inner child or parts therapy. Um, you know, I, I lean into gestalt therapy, Carl Jung's archetypical work, internal family systems work, um, and that's really powerful for understanding these parts of ourselves. Let me be very clear. We're not talking about split off parts. We're not talking about multiple personality disorder or bipolar or schizophrenia or anything like that. We're talking about the parts of ourselves, the way we understand the world in compartments. Mm. That's all it is. And sometimes these compartments are hyper protective that keep us from living into the relationships that we want to. So we heal those parts in order to heal the whole. That's essentially what it is. Okay. And that feels like it can be kind of scary for some people for sure right yes. and so i guess how how can you move forward from the space of a fear and wanting to be exactly what you just described you know to just be in that space where you're open and you're ready and you're and you're willing um what would you give in terms of advice for somebody who feels like they don't really know what to do next don't do it by yourself. Like definitely I'm a big advocate of self-reliance, particularly for men and, and people wanting to cultivate masculine energy, but men also need support. And we have had support for hundreds of thousands of years, millennia. Mm-hmm. And you don't do it by yourself. Seek a shaman, a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, a social support group, a group of friends, whatever it may be, a spiritual healers, energy healers, don't do it on your own. We can't see the forest through the trees. We need new perspectives it's very useful to have new perspectives and it helps us feel safe enough to explore a new way of being. Mm. And we can then slowly unravel ourselves from the pain that we're accustomed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. I think it's, it's a perfect advice for somebody who doesn't know where to start. And um, I would honestly love, I'm like dying to hear this from coming from you directly, but your story with your wife, and how much it has played a part. Like you guys met online, I believe, right? I don't really know the full story, but can you share, you know, what you've learned with her, which I feel like is an infinite probably, but just how you guys met and how, you know, what shifted in you and what shifted in her when you guys got together? So we were introduced by mutual friends. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, you could say we met online, so to speak, but it wasn't online dating or anything like that. We were just just introduced. via friends it's a big question um what is 
I don't know if I can answer that per se. <laughs> it's, I mean, so much. Uh, you know, I've learned more about myself in terms of my own wounds. Um, I've stepped into greater versions of myself. I have learned about um, my wife, of course, and what her needs are and her vulnerabilities, her insecurities. She's learned more about mine. I've learned more about mine. Mm-hmm. We're a tremendous support system and a, um, a challenge for each other as well in healthy ways and sometimes unhealthy ways because we come from old wounding, you know, but we get to work through that. And in real time, we get to shift the relationship that we once had to that pain and fear that is now different. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's so much that we continue to, and I think as individuals, we never stop growing and we never stop, um, we never stop shifting and changing. Mm-hmm. Completely. And you guys, I think what I, I heard her talk on a podcast with, um, Aubrey Marcus, and she was explaining how, um, and maybe you were in the same state where like, when you, when we really focus on our, on our own self-love that's when we're able to really expand our own hearts and allow to receive, you know, the gifts and the abundance and love from everything around us. So do you feel like that was a big part for your own work too? Just not even just what you teach now, but like how you were able to welcome in. Yep. I was completely, I was completely happy with where I was in my life. I wasn't really seeking um, being an intimate relationship. I was open to it though. Um, but I wasn't seeking it actively. I was very, very, I was deeply content with who I was. And for the first time in my life, I really wasn't looking uh, outside of me in terms of an intimate um, relationship, romantic partnership to define myself or my worth. Um, and that's when, uh, you know, really when I put the final pieces around that, that healing, that's when I literally was introduced to her a few days later. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Literally a few days, like four days later. That's incredible. I love yeah. that. And so how can you, how can people be more in their, their own state of self-love or even like self-care? I feel like there's, there's two completely different aspects, you know, um, to both of those things. And I think a lot of people are confused now with what self-love even means. And um, how can we practice that moving forward in our own lives? I think being more self-honoring can mm-hmm. really be useful. Just be just honor yourself at a deeper level. Speak your truth when you need to. Stand up for yourself. Do the things that you really enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, know what your highest values are. I mean, that self-honoring leads to self-love. Make self-empowering choices. Um, that doesn't mean be hyper-selfish. It just means consider yourself deeply in the decisions that you make about who you are. Mm-hmm. Mm. Amazing. I feel like I would love to ask you now if you obviously would, would like to share with us, but maybe some books that would be very helpful for some people to just understand more um, about relationships, conscious relationships, um, even, you know, where they can find you and your own work, uh, Mm. what you offer and how you can assist them to really start embodying this person they want to become, not just for themselves, but also for the Mm. relationships that they want to experience. Yeah. Um, Michaela Bowen's work is great. David, da- some of Data- David Data's work is great. Um, uh, Keeping the Love You Find um, is really great. Is is a good book by um, I've forgotten the the, the name <laughs> of the author. Yeah, he's a, he's an older gentleman. Um, he, I mean, he must be in his eighties now. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's a, that's a really great... I mean, there's so many great relationship books out there. I mean, I don't... I'm just looking back here, what I have. And I, I don't even have most of my books here. I literally have two full suitcases. No, like three full suitcases of books that are still in Australia because I live in, in the US now. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm just looking if I have any of those here. I don't. Mm. There's many great books out there, though. Um mm-hmm. And what your other question was, where you can find me? Yeah, like if people wanted to start working with you, you know, how, how specifically, like what do you teach? Like, speci- like, do you have like a step-by-step program or do you just kind of flow with your clients? How does that work? I have many different programs available. Um, I do a great deal of one-on-one deep dive coaching um, and I'll run programs by myself, uh, both virtual online and offline uh, with my wife and on my own. Um, you can find more, you can find out more about that at growwithsteph.com, www.growwithsteph.com. And 
one of the programs that we have at the moment is a, is a program that Christine created and I've added some modules to that. It's called mastery and you can find more, you can find that on um, growwithsteph.com. Actually, you'll be able to um, see uh, there's a, a, a link there to mastery. And this is a program that she created and I've added some um, modules to that. And it's a very powerful program for um, really uh, in, learning how to empower self. We live in, turbulent tumultuous times right now we are as a community as a global community we're really struggling and there's a lot of uncertainty mastery gives you the tools to help you regain your perspective and your power back now that's an ongoing online program that you can you can purchase at any time however what we're doing beginning at the end of october towards the end of october is we're going to do a six-week live training that includes mastery and includes having access to Christine and I for six weeks live. There's going to be a number of different, there's going to be like eight or nine different live sessions over six weeks where you're going to learn at a deeper level, get questions asked, answered, live coaching, breath work. It's going to be pretty powerful. Um, there'll be somatic work that we'll do there as well. They're all virtual, um, but an amazing opportunity. So yeah, you can check that out on my website, uh, growwithsteph.com. Mm, that's amazing. Perfect. I'll also put like all your information in the show notes so people can access that super easily. Um, and yeah, honestly, I feel like that was a really good conversation. I feel like I really asked you all the questions I really want to ask you. And I want to thank you again for your time, your energy, your presence, for just being here, sharing what you know. And I hope that, you know, some people feel called to finding you and doing the work for themselves. Because again, like, when they do the work for themselves, they do the work for others as, as well. And we're in a space now that I feel like it's kind of time that we do the work, you know, for our entire collective. Because like you said, there's a lot going on right now. So I think this is like the biggest gift that we can give ourselves and to the world. So wanted to thank you. And like, I'm, I'm sharing my gratitude for being one of those people to lead others in that sense of just embodying more love. Thank you. I appreciate you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Have an amazing day, Stephanos. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Well, guys, I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Stephanos. We had spoken about a lot of different things when it comes to relationships. And I just hope that at least it helped you see to what extent how much you attract really what you put out there, whether it has to do with relationships or business. This is just another aspect that is correlating completely to your energy projecting something and therefore attracting something. So I hope it inspired you to start looking at yourself and your own pattern and your heart and just choosing to love yourself deeper today, whether it's buying a new book or choosing to work with a coach or even, you know, signing up for a retreat, which if you have been listening to my podcast for a while, you know, you know that I have been so, so looking forward to actually creating a retreat somewhere in the world. And I'm excited to share the details about that because it's finally happening. On that note, my loves, if you're looking to have more information about Stefano, so you can find him on Instagram, all his details are in the show notes, including his website, his different ways that you can work with him or courses. It's all there. But but I really want to thank you for just being here. It means that you're open to know more. You're open to just receive more knowledge and wisdom when it comes to making your relationships a better partnership. And that means a lot, not just for you, but like I said, for everyone around you and that includes the world. So on that note, my loves, I'm excited to share more of the other interviews that I had done in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we have Meg Sylvester coming up. We have another one with Nick Walker, who actually is a podcast host and had interviewed me on his own podcast called Soul Food for Thought. So if you want to check it out, it's already out, but I'll be posting the actual interview on my podcast so you guys can listen to it there because I don't exactly remember what I said, but I know for a fact that there was a lot of good shit that was being said. So I'm excited to share with you guys. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Like I said at the beginning, and we'll keep seeing it again. I'm just really grateful for you guys. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you on the next episode.